This program, entitled Well-Being, The Five Essential Elements, is all about you and your overall well-being. There are five functional domains, just as, as there are five functional fingers. So I want to relate your overall well-being to your hand and those five fingers, and hopefully I can convince you that you have the power in your hand to create overall body well-being. As a brief overview, it shows the five domains, career, social, financial, and physical, and community, with the five fingers. So the thumb, which is the most important digit in our hand, relates with career well-being because it's the, the most important to overall well-being. The index finger, which is a very social finger, relates to our social well-being. The middle finger, the only thing is that it's the longest finger, so it has the greatest amount of time or greatest amount of relationship to our finances because our finances are important to us from the time that we start work till the time that we retire and the time that we even die, will our finances follow us all the way through. And then physical for our ring finger. So it used to be thought that on the left hand there was a vein that ran from your left ring finger directly to your heart. We know that that's not true, but our heart is very important for our overall physical well-being, so that's why it's associated with the ring finger. And then community is our pinky finger, and unfortunately the community well-being is the least th thought about in overall well-being, and that's why it's related to the pinky. And so I want you to keep in mind there's three aspects, thriving, struggling, and suffering. So each of these areas will either be thriving, struggling, or suffering, and then overall, all five components will either be thriving, struggling, and suffering. So please keep that in mind. So here we can see that where did all this information come from? This came from Gallup, who has been polling people around the world for many, many years. And so they created a book in 2010 called well-being. And so that information came from surveying more than 150 countries from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe. So hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of questions asking people about their health, about their wealth, their relationships. And so this gave Gallup a lens into a large portion of the population in overall body well-being. So here's the five areas again and realizing that at least 66% of us are thriving in one area, at least. So that's good. However, it could be better if we're thriving in all areas. So unfortunately, the research is showing that only 7% of us are thriving in all five of these areas. So that's why this presentation is here, to give, give us some information to help us thrive in all five of these areas. You can see from this graphic here on the upper right, there's a whole lot of different components in well-being, but what they found is that the five areas, the five domains, represent basically, there are five big areas and they represent our whole body well-being. So they don't represent every single aspect of well-being, but they represent enough of the overall body well-being to give us a clear picture. So the downside is if we even struggle in one of these five domains, our overall well-being will start to decline. And on the positive side, if we even strengthen even one of these areas, then our overall well-being will start to thrive a little bit better. And so what's really great about this is these elements are universal. It covers over ethnicities, it co covers over faiths, religions, populations. And so even though people may get to the overall well-being a different way, these elements are truly universal for all people. First and foremost, it's all about short-term decisions, and this is every day we make decisions. And so my firmly belief that these domains, these five domains, are going to provide us the route to happiness. And so we just have to make good decisions with all of our decisions. We try to, obviously, but we make decisions every single day about our health, how we feel, about what we do, and they're just split-second decisions that we don't think about, so I want us to focus on those decisions. We as Americans, we have, unfortunately, we look to short-term fixes sometimes. So we've seen these kind of ads all over the newspaper and the magazine and the media as there's some kind of wonder thing that can make us feel better, it can make us lose weight faster, on and on and on. So realizing that short-term answers rarely lead to long-term results. So we need to make those short-term decisions count and we need to make them every day count, and then we're going to improve overall each and every day. Now we're going to start first with career well-being, which is the most important, so it's the most essential of the five elements. The first thing is, what do you do? So if I came up and introduced myself, said, hi, my name is Steve, what's your name, and what do you do? 
how you respond to me may be a, a, a clue into how you feel about your career and your overall well-being. So if you're excited about your career, you're excited about, you're engaged, you're passionate about your career, then or what you do, then there's a good chance that your career well-being will be thriving. So do you like what you do? The survey that Gallup found that only 20% of the people that surveyed actually gave a hard fast yes to they actually like what they do. Okay, so that leaves another 80% out there that are somewhere between I kind of I really like what I do and I really don't like what I do. And so but we want to focus well we want to get people engaged and we'd like to get people engaged in what they do for a living. But what do you look forward to? You may have a hobby, you may have a pursuit, you may have some other aspect that you're very passionate about and you're very engaged in, and that's great. And so it may not be your job, and that's fine. If you are engaged or have passion about some other thing, there's a good chance that your career well-being will be thriving, and that's great. And then our identity. What we do on a daily basis makes up our identity. So depending upon what you do and the job that you do and everything you're involved with, your friends, that makes up our identity in our career well-being. Okay, remember we're talking about thriving, struggling, and suffering in each of these domains. So using our strengths daily will help us improve our career well-being. So there's a book out there called Strength Finders, and it's certainly easy obtainable. And you can, if you buy the book, you can read it. The book is very easy to read. And then... What Gallup will allow you to do, then in the back of the book, there is a code that you can put in. You get access to their Strength Finder website, and you can find out your top five strengths. There's 34 strengths, and so this survey will give you your top five, and it will demonstrate some light on your strength. And so what's cool about this, if we can use our strengths daily in our job, then our career well-being will be enhanced. So also number two is having a purpose and a plan for our life and achieve, attaining goals is important. Number three, if we have a manager that enables us to feel enthusiastic about our job and our future, our career well-being will increase. And then if we have friends with, with Pat to share our same passion about whatever it is that we're excited about, then there's a good chance that our career well-being will start to thrive. So moving into just a little bit different topic now on overall well-being. Anybody who participated in the wellness incentive, you did a online HRA through Pacific Source through WebMD. And so we had about 469 people complete that last year. And what was shown is the top three things that people have concerns about or need to be aware of is that 65% of us are under stress. About 29% of us have some depression feelings. And there's a number of us that are concerned about our weight. And so those three things will help us, the city, to create better programming to help people try to reduce their stress, to be more informed about how they feel, and to uh, ways that they can control their weight. Right now there's Weight Watchers. The city is actively participating or promoting Weight Watchers in the city. So if you're interested in that, just uh, go to the benefits website and you can see all the information you need to do that, to be involved with that. So stress comes to us all different ways, shapes and forms. Some personal, family, and work, we know that all three of those areas create stress some of the time, and so it's just not work. And so we have to be aware of, of all the different things that create stress in us. And so just a little bit about stress. The, the old thought was fight and flight were the only two concepts of stress. When we got that response, we either run away or we stay and fight. Well, now we know that that's not necessarily true. There's a freeze and a fawn. So because our situations are so different these days that most of us are working at a desk, and so we're under stress, our body's being bombarded by signals from our brain. This is the amygdala, which is in our brain, these little red, no, they're not red in our brain, but these little cells in our brain that when they're under stress, they signal straight to the um, adrenal medullas, which are sitting on top of the kidneys, and those things cause the kidneys, or cause the body to release adrenaline and cortisol, which have, if we're fighting for our life, if we're fleeing, they help us. But if we're sitting at our desk, they just torture the inside of our body. So if we're under stress constantly and we're not getting these things straightened out, we're going to increase our risk of having high blood pressure, increase our risk of having a heart attack, increase our risk of having a stroke, diabetes, all these bad things that can happen to us because of stress. So we have to get our stress under control. And this focus, this presentation isn't about stress, but it's certainly important in our life that we need to get stress under control. Moving on to the second domain, which is social well-being. Remember, that's your index finger. 
and this graphic is very key that we're all connected. So I'm connected with my friends, they're connected with their friends, and so then I'm connected with their friends. So we know that our relationships shape our expectations, our desires, our goals. People around us affect our well-being. Friends of our friends affect our well-being. And our entire network will affect our social well-being, which then affects our overall well-being. So relationships are important and they affect our whole life. What the research has shown is that we need to have enough social time to keep stress away. And so they've demonstrated that six hours a day of social time is important for us to thrive. So that means talking with our coworkers, talking with our friends, talking with our family members, communicating with people on an ongoing basis all counts to our social well-being. They've also found that social interaction and physical activity, when you combine those, they have a compounding effect, which means a, a doubling a positive effect on our social well-being. And then we need to realize that our relationships help us in tough times. So the research has demonstrated that if we've got close friends, our cardiovascular functioning will be improved and our stress levels will be reduced just because we've got a good social network. And we need to realize that one friend can't do it all. Research has demonstrated that we need three to four close relationships to help us be healthier. So the people that have three to four close friends, they are healthier, they have a higher well-being, and they're more engaged at work. So if you've got one close friend, that's great. It, it may be beneficial for you to start thinking about expanding your, your friendship ring and so you can get some other people in there that you would feel would benefit you and have a close relationship. The essentials of social well-being work towards that six hours a day, socializing with friends and family. We want to strengthen the connections we already have and we want to mix social time with physical activity to enhance and get our social well-being to thrive. Moving on to the financial well-being, so that's our middle finger. And the number one thing we can do is have some kind of positive default, so putting money away automatically into a savings account, retirement account, so we can thrive in the future. That's so critical. So we don't want to wait until we're halfway through with our career and say, oh, I better get involved with my retirement. You want to do that right away. So I encourage everybody to be active in the retirement. So when you retire, you've got enough money to meet the needs for you and your family. The interesting thing about financial well-being is that they found that people with a high career well-being perceive the same amount of money or pay more favorably than, low, than those with a low career, career well-being. So that's just, if I'm happy with my job and I'm a, and I've got passion and I'm, I'm engaged in my job, I'm going to feel better about the money that I make. They've also found that people with a high career well-being and a high social well-being are two times more likely to be satisfied with their standard of living and stay in their job. So that's great for the city if, if people can be happy in their job, they're happy with their social well-being and their social network they have, then they're more likely to, to be satisfied and stay in their job, which is great. So Harvard researchers have determined that spending money on ourselves does not boost our financial well-being and does not boost our overall well-being. So a bad mood, so if we're under stress and we're feeling bad, we go out and we buy some food, we buy something that we think will make us feel better, and so in the moment it may, but long term, bad moods can create a cascade of poor financial decisions, and so we want to avoid that. What researchers have found is that spending money on others will boost our financial well-being and our overall well-being. So the great thing about buying experiences and memories, especially if you have a family, let's, for example, you start talking about a vacation, you get the information, the pamphlets, the flyers, the you go online, whatever, you get excited about it, then you, the moment is there, you go on your vacation, you're excited about it, you take all kinds of pictures, have all, call in all kinds of great memories. Then once you're coming back from your vacation, you relive those things, you look at the pictures, and so all those things go into boosting our overall well-being. Okay, looking at some key drivers, I think, is important for financial well-being. So financial security is the perception that we have enough money to meet our needs. So it's either yes or no, and so we either know we're making headway into having a, enough money for our retirement, or we need to work harder on that. They've also shown that lack of worry about money has twice the impact on our overall uh, well-being over your income. So 
no matter what your income is, if you're not worrying about that, then you, you have two times the benefit of boosting your overall well-being. And they've realized that focusing solely on wealth accumulation is not the way to go for boosting our well-being. And finally, the essentials of financial well-being is being satisfied with your overall standard, managing your personal finances to create security, and they found that people with a high financial well-being spend their money wisely, and it's important to buy experiences and buy memories and, and to give to others. All those will boost your financial well-being as well as your overall well-being. Moving on to the physical well-being domain, so just keep in mind that everything we do, each bite we take, every drink of something, whether or not we're active or exercise, whether or not we get enough sleep, all those either create net positive results in us or net negative results. And all those things go to create a physically healthy life and either increase or decrease our physical well-being. So it's important to realize that if, if we're interested in making dietary changes or activity changes in our life, that we first, we have to understand how a poor diet or eating not so good food, how it affects us, or how being sedentary and not leading an active lifestyle affects us. So those are very major things, and those are not easy things to change. And I know that better than anybody, just uh, it's, it's difficult in my life sometimes to make these changes. And I've dealt with hundreds of people throughout my years here at the city that struggle to make these changes. And so I'm here to support you in any way, shape, or form I can into making healthier choices for you. Focusing on the nutrition area very quickly, there's three things or three questions you can ask yourself, and it will go a long way to improving your overall nutrition, and which would improve your overall health. So number one, am I really hungry? Am I truly hungry? Do I need to eat right now? Second thing is, what I'm about to eat, is it smart? So we can look at, if we're eating this, I don't think that's the smarter decision if we're eating things like this. So we want to be smart about the things that we eat. And then how much do I really need would be the third question. So do I need to have my third plate full or can just one plate be enough for me? Truly, we have to figure out how much we need to be healthy and to be satisfied. What they have shown is that people who exercise are active at least two days a week are happier and has, have significantly less stress, which is great. So it's not to say that that's all we need is two days of activity or exercise, but it's to say that people who are doing that consistently at least two days a week are happier and have significantly less stress. These benefits will increase up to six days, and so the recommendation for, is to be active or exercise on most days of the week, which depending upon how you define most days, but to me that's between five and six days a week. And the research has also shown that 20 minutes of exercise can improve our mood for up to 12 hours, which is awesome. And unfortunately for us as Americans, the research has shown only about 27% are even coming close to, or are only getting the recommended exercise or activity on most days of the week. What's very exciting in the new research area is showing the, how active our brain is with exercise and activity. So with fighting fatigue, the researchers have found now that it's better to fight fatigue with exercise or going on a 20 minute walk than using prescription drugs. So you can see from this graphic here, this is somebody who's sitting quietly and they're mostly blue with a little bit of green and it's just, just a scotch of yellow. But somebody who is going or just finished a 20 minute walk, you can see that their brain is all lit up with activity from that just moving, walking for 20 minutes. So that's exciting to know that Every time we are active and exercise, our brain gets all excited and there's a lot of brain function going on. And what they found out is that people who exercise regularly feel better about themselves and their appearance. Another new area of research that is being explored is this thing called gene expression. And so what they're finding is that people that are active or exercising or people that are involved with their mental health are able to silence the gene expression, meaning that they're reducing their chances of getting cancer, heart disease, diabetes, stroke, all these diseases because we're, uh, we're silencing these genes. And so that's very exciting. And we know for a fact that about 75% of all of our medical costs are due to largely preventable conditions. So exercising or not, eating healthy or not, being active or not, taking care of our stress, not using tobacco, all those things go into play in our medical costs. So we know that 75% is related to our personal choices. Now getting into sleep 
And so I want to position sleep as your daily reset button. So when we sleep, it clears out the stressors from the previous day. And realizing that sleep is a, is a critically important role in our overall well-being. So average sleep right now is about 6.7 hours. We need to be getting about 7 to 8 hours. And so if you can do that, great. Um, if, you, if you're not getting that much, I would encourage you to, to work on trying to get that much. The research has also demonstrated that people who get less than 6 hours or more than 9 hours seem to have more health problems than people who get the 7 to 8 hours. Also exciting new area of research is that they're discovering that learning can happen while we sleep because we're making these connections in our brain while we're sleeping so people can actually get smarter from sleeping, having a good night's sleep, which is exciting. And so I, again, encourage you to work on getting seven to eight hours of sleep per night. And finally, the essentials of well-being, physical well-being, we want to be active or exercise regularly. We want to make good nutrition choices. And finally, we want to get enough sleep. Moving on to the fifth domain, which is community well-being. And unfortunately for us, it's not the first thing we think about, our community and our overall well-being. So that's unfortunate. I think we can... Mm-hmm. <clears throat>